Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Well, the day has arrived at last when I'm planning to try and get my machine up to a, um, a better level of cutting efficiency. The last time I checked this uh, a couple of three weeks ago, I was out of my 70 watts that was available, I was losing somewhere in the region of about um, probably 12 watts or something like that. Now, I'd previously ordered some copper mirrors and a new lens, just an ordinary lens, not an HQ lens. Um, the problem is, the mirrors have turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. They're beautiful mirrors, but what is the point of having a gold-coated copper mirror? Okay, so they gold-coat them to stop the oxidation, but that isn't what I ordered. I ordered a copper mirror, not a gold-flashed copper mirror. Um, I'm very happy that copper, whether it's oxidised or not, is very high efficiency. Gold is marginally lower efficiency at reflecting infrared than copper from all the figures that I've seen. It's still very good and I'm sure that these mirrors will help me but they're not what I was expecting so I'm a little bit ungrateful but then again as my wife tells me I'm becoming a grumpy old man. Well to help me with today's testing um, I have made myself some target holders for my machine in the same way that I've made them for the Think Glacer machine. Now I'm using exactly the same targets so I've designed these pieces of plastic here to hold the same targets um, so I mean I've only got to make I've only got to make one design of target. Now one of the functions on the keyboard that you guys may or may not be aware of is if you press the ZU button you can get down here to something called laser set. Now that's a very useful feature because if we press enter we get the choice here of having something called continuous or if we move the left or right hand button we can move to another thing called manual and when we're into manual we get the opportunity here of milliseconds. Now milliseconds is a thousand of them in a second. If I want to pulse the laser for a fixed period of time and let's just say I want to pulse it for one tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds. So that's a tenth of a second pulse. So we're happy with that we can press enter and then escape will get us back to the normal system and then we'll set max power. Now Max power, I'm going to set that down to as little as about 15%. So basically what I've done there, when I press that pulse button now, I should get 15% power for a tenth of a second. And that's useful because it means I can get a fixed pulse onto my target. Now my second mirror, I've also got a target and a target holder. So I can do the same thing again, pulse. And the great thing is I haven't got to look around the corner at the result. So the other great advantage is I can drive it right to zero and I can do a pulse there now. And there we go, we can see that the uh, the beam is nicely lined up on the centre of the target more or less in both positions with this x-axis because I've put myself a target holder on here. Now the target holder just slips off, it literally just clips on with a little teeny weeny bit of friction because of the fit that I've made it and again I can just pulse oh and that's a little bit out that one the other thing we have to note is that the pulse is getting weaker so not only is it out of position it's also getting weaker so we can move this back to the other end of the machine here and put another target in pulse and that one looks to be just about just a hint low. So this is what's coming out of mirror number one. This is what's coming out of mirror number two. Just here. And you can see that we've lost power. So there's definitely something wrong with the mirror even though the target looks to be it's just marginally low there. So you know technically this this head needs to probably go up the head needs to drop very slightly. But let's have a look at what it was like at the other end. So that was the back end and this is the front end. So there's not a problem with the height 
it's it's pretty well centered it's just a fraction low but what it is it's a problem with the left right motion so we need to if anything possibly just steer the beam across to get it perfect now I'm not going to do that because I'm going to mess around with the mirrors but what we are going to do is to set a definition beam up we're going to use the red pointer beam to set up a reference beam so we'll do the burn check just one more time with a pulse just so that I've got a reference Right, we're looking through my spy hole at the back of the machine here to target number two and as you can see I've now set the target up so that it is spot on the centre of target number two. And if I remove target number two and let it come through to target number three, so although I made it right at target number two, Okay, now I've made it right at target number three. Now when I adjust mirrors number one and two, I can immediately use this beam here as a reference <coughs> to set mirrors number one and number two back onto the, exactly the same position. So the one thing I mustn't do is to touch the actual reference beam itself. Okay, now my calibration chart there on the machine tells me that if I want 70 watts out of the tube, I've got to demand 63%. So I'll set the power to 63%. Okay, now here I have my bucket of room temperature water, ambient temperature, which has been sitting in here. And we will start the test off by referencing it to this value. And it seems to have settled at around about 8 degrees C. So it's not particularly warm in this workshop. workshop. Now I've pressed the button to start the power off, but I don't have to panic too much because I've got uh, about probably 10 seconds before the tests start. 8.8 42 point seven 8.8 equals times Two equals 67.8 9.2 now it's very unlikely I'm ever going to get this accurate to within the nearest point one of a degree C or anything like that because it's just not that sort of system this is not a scientific piece of equipment this is a piece of string with knots in it well let's just take a quick look at the results that we got. Obviously I wasn't going to drag you through doing hundreds of results. Um, you've seen in principle how I'm going to do it, which is to check before and after mirror one. So these are the results that I got. I did ten tests. Um, the first three tests I ignored because it looked as though the laser was actually heating up very slightly, although it started off at about 67.5 it gradually moved up into the 68s after two or three readings. So I ignored those and said, let's just now hopefully have a stable output and we can then work with the results. Well, that left me with seven results. And then what I did, of those seven results, I discarded the top and the bottom result and kept the middle five. And I've taken an average of the middle five results. Now, you can argue about the statistics of whether or not that's the right or wrong way to do it, but that's the way that I'm going to do it. We've got two problems here with stability. The system that I'm using is accurate to maybe 0.1 of a degree C. It might resolve to 0.1 of a degree C. Whether it's capable of measuring repeatably to 0.1 of a degree C is an interesting question. And then, of course, I'm going to double the result because of the scaling factor that I'm using. So if I get a 0.1 degree error, then I'm doubling it to 0.2. Now the other thing that's quite important to remember here, and it's, it's quite amazingly good, surprisingly enough, the laser tube itself claims a stability of no more than 10%. Now you could regard that as plus or minus 5% on a nominal. It could be 10% down. I don't know what it means, but the claim is that it's 10%. Well, we certainly got results here which are um, substantially better than that. I mean 10% of 70 is 7. We haven't got anywhere near a spread of 7 watts in our results. So 
basically the, the, the tube is pretty stable but we've got to accept that from result to result there may be some variation that would account for some of these um, changes that we've got here. I was keeping an eye on the current and the current remained basically pretty level at about 21 milliamps throughout all the tests so whatever the variation was here was not necessarily current related and at the end of the day what we've got is a 93.5% efficient mirror so we're losing 6.5% on that mirror number one so what we're now going to do is change mirror number one for a copper mirror and see whether or not we can improve that statistic I'm not going to drag you through all the results but I will show you changing the mirror and how I'm going to go about changing the mirror and setting it back up again so I've set the head as far as I can away from the laser beam so I've got the longest beam path possible and we're going to just do a pulse now it seems like a slightly stronger pulse today than it was before but I have got the temperature of the water up quite a bit higher but that's because it's been a particularly cold night uh, below freezing and what I did I left my um, I left my tank on with a hundred watts of heat light underneath it as you can see so the actual tank has remained nice and warm overnight and it's been circulating warm water through the tube so there's no chance that the tube will ever freeze and it's sitting there at about 26.9 but it doesn't really matter what the power is because what we're doing you're going to be checking before and after the new mirror again so what we will be seeing regardless of whether the laser power is high or low we'll be looking at the basic relative losses on the mirror not absolute values so there we are we've set the bright spot on the laser beam to the center of the burn mark okay no fear let's just go for it we'll just undo the tension from the springs and we'll just remove the screws at all stages I'm being very careful not to disturb or touch this reference beam here right that's the mirror removed remove the mirror itself you might like to take a look at that look that was the molybdenum mirror that I put in there about three weeks ago cleaned it it's already fogged over so fairly unimpressed with that and we'll put our nice crisp gold plated copper mirror that's the gold plated and the other side's copper as you can see so we very carefully drop that into position there that mirror is nicely clamped in there now bear in mind that these pivot points have not been touched so the actual adjusting screws should basically still have the mirror pretty well aligned but I'm absolutely sure we shall have to just tweak them so we put the tension back on the springs now so let's go and have a look before we do anything else let's go and have a look to see where the dot is I think the first observation we will make is that OMG that is a bright dot and that's after just one mirror change so what we'll do, we'll first of all set that mirror up again by putting the dot back onto its reference spot. And this is why this is why I'm not in the least bit worried about playing with mirrors, because once you've got this reference beam, we can decide that we want it to go slightly to the uh, left, for example, or slightly to the right, like that. Oh, I think I'm nearly there without having to do much more than one screw twist now it is after all only approximately setting the mirrors back up again because we're still going to have to go through ultimately and do a proper burn test alignment with the targets but basically we've now put mirror number one back in exactly the same place as it was before and that took what three or four minutes so the reference beam has now the, the reference beam has now been removed I can turn the laser back on now just for comparison I've put the old target there for you let's just do a pulse and see what we get there's our after and there's our before now you can see two, th two obvious things first of all this mark is definitely blacker than that mark 
So for the same pulse length, we've got more power arriving at this mirror, at this point here, after just two mirrors. And the second thing that we can see is we've got a much better formed beam. This is round and this is not very round. So without going anywhere near it with the power meter, we can immediately visually see that we've got more power coming through that mirror. 8.1 8.0 so we're going to go for 8.0 well I'm singularly unimpressed with the results from those copper from, from those gold plated mirrors and I'm going to go go back as far as putting my not very good quality you can probably see towards the edges they're bent there's a straight line across the middle and they're not particularly shiny polished a little bit I had to stop my test yesterday because I came across a serious problem the results that we already had in the can were for my molybdenum and mirror I put my gold coated mirror in and I was still losing four watts with a brand new mirror. Unbelievable. So, I thought, well, that's crap. That must be the gold. I told you the copper was better, so I put my copper mirror back in. I'm sorry, I'm still losing about three and a half or four watts. So, there is a problem here somewhere. And I'm trying to guess what the problem is. Now, I laid in bed last night and thought about it in my going to sleep hours. And I think I know what the problem is. Now today, you are following me on this journey of discovery and I hope I've realised what the problem is. Now I am going to demonstrate it to you. I've never done this before, but I think I'm going to demonstrate to you what the problem is. So I could be chasing fairies, you see, in trying to get this mirror up to what comes in goes out. Because I think that what goes in doesn't come out for a very good reason. So the first thing I'm going to do, I've set the power up to the maximum I can get. I've got 70 watts or 68 watts firing at that paper target. Now you're going to say, but it's going to blow a hole in it. Yes I know, but I've got my copper mirror behind there and I don't care about the copper mirror because the copper mirror will clean up just like that. I'm not worried about it, so I don't think I shall smoke it, but what I need to do, I'm trying to see what size the beam is that's coming out of this machine. So that it doesn't catch fire, I might just pulse it through to start with. 25 watts. So I'll do it at 25 watts, bearing in mind it's going to run for a tenth of a second, because that's how I've got the pulse set. I've just dipped my target in water to try and stop it from catching fire. Right, we'll start the program off and I might have to pause it. Now, now the first thing I want you to note is the size of the beam. Now, this is supposed to be about a five millimeter diameter beam. Now before we start, Bear in mind there are scorch marks around the outside. How did that scorch beyond the beam size? Well I've got a bag of goodies here and basically it's something else that I've made to fit this target holder. It's a piece of 8mm thick acrylic that has been cut and marked with the centre of the target on it. And what I'm going to do is to mount it on the target holder and what I've also got down here which you can't see but I've got this piece of pipe here which if you can listen it's being fed by my old air pump my low original a pump and what it's doing is blowing air at this area because if I don't blow air at it and take the fumes away it will catch fire 
the fumes will catch fire because they're inflammable. I'm going to fire 70 watts at that target and we're going to see what happens. And here we go. You can see the fumes coming off. It's just about not catching fire. <coughs> now apart from the fact that it's not central, which is good news, bad news, <laughs> I'll explain that in a minute. <laughs> Let's take a look at what we've got. Now as I said, this is a voyage of discovery as much for me as it is for you. You're coming along with my journey. This is not rehearsed in any way at all. Um, I just laid and thought about this last night and realised what I think is happening. And we're just about to try and prove that. Now first of all, you would think that this is probably, if you look at the specification for these tubes, they say that they're a five or a six millimetre diameter beam. What we've got here is the laser, the central laser tube itself, with the laser beam coming down, up and down inside there. Now this is the final mirror, which is a partial reflecting mirror. Certain of it goes back and reflects back inside the machine, and a small percentage of it is allowed to escape out to form our usable power laser beam. Now, the question is, I'm told that that's probably going to be round about six millimetres. We know that's not true because we've just measured this hole here at 7.8. But that's only what we can see. Now, what I've drawn here, very badly, but I hope you get the, the, the correct impression is, this is the laser beam that's coming out of here and it has a di an energy density profile and that energy density profile and I'll draw it the way that we've been able to see it because the more the energy the deeper the cut and what we've seen there is we've got a cut which is like that and stops at the surface okay so the higher the energy density in the middle of the beam the deeper it will cut and as it gets towards the edge, I've drawn it in, hopefully, in my very bad artistic manner, slightly less and less grey, um, the energy density is getting lower, and so consequently its damage ability is getting less, and it can't cut in as deeply. If it was uniform, the shape of that beam cut would be like that, and it's not. So this acrylic tells us exactly what's happening in that laser beam the profile of the laser beam. Now, the point is, it takes a certain amount of energy to sublimate or evaporate this acrylic. Just because we've stopped here at 8 millimetres, or 7.8 millimetres, doesn't mean to say that's where the energy finishes. Now, when we cut the hole in the card, the hole in the card is around about 8 0.5. So that tells us that there's more energy than what we can see with this technique. But of course there's a further there's a further band of heating that's taking place. If we look carefully at this card you'll see that not only has it got a hole in it it's also got a scorch mark around the edge. Now the scorch mark didn't get there on its own it's trying to burn and the diameter of the scorch mark itself takes us now out to nine millimeters so from a six millimeter beam we've all of a sudden got a nine millimeter beam but that's only measuring enough power that will scorch cardboard and that's damp cardboard remember so what I'm now going to do is see if we can find out how big this beam actually gets because that is crucial to how we set the mirrors up. Now how am I going to do that? Well, let's go and see. Now what I've got on the top of the screen there is a digital thermometer and I've got a K-type thermocouple here and as you can see, when I hold it, it's very responsive to change of temperature. 13, so it's going up immediately. So 
what I'm now going to do is run the program and we're going to run the probe in across this surface here like this and we're going to watch to see where we can find the edge of the beam well sadly we've got nothing to measure against but we will still try and see if we can find out where the edge of the beam is there we go it's starting to go up now 30 34 now we're going up into the 90s and the hundreds so that's definitely the edge of the beam there so there's the edge of the beam there now anything that will cause this thermocouple to heat up or register temperature is energy it's power it's watts because I know where it was in relation to that black mark there there we go look 11 and a half millimeters that's not far off of where that beam burnt out to okay now it's actually slightly beyond it I had number one mirror off of the machine this morning and I've very carefully measured it and drawn a little CAD diagram of exactly what's happening inside there. Now the first thing that happens is that's the mirror and the mirror is set back from the face by 1.5 millimeters so there's already a ridge round there and so consequently the beam when it comes in the only mirror the only free mirror area that there is without any obstruction is 12.5 12.6 millimeters diameter no it's not a diameter because how the laser beam sees it is actually like this this is the 12.6 and 12.6 is actually slightly less than that ring there so if I superimpose that one on top of there it just sits slightly inside it well hang about this is that target and I'm already scorching out to about there so I'm already outside the mirror and what I'm actually, what I deduced last night when I was in bed was that there must be some power clipping on the edge of the mirror. What we've done, we've established where the edge of the beam is. The edge of the beam is a long way beyond where we think it is. So when we measured this before, we established that the beam was about nine millimeters diameter. It looks as though, Although its burning capability in acrylic is 7.8 and its burning ability in thin card is 8.5 and its scorching ability is 9 millimeters, the edge of its power looks as though it may well be out at 10 or 11 millimeters. And that is where I'm losing my 4 watts of power. It's never getting into the mirror to come out. I'm measuring everything here with my power meter. I'm measuring the whole lot. But once it's passed through the mirror, I've lost the edge of the beam. So the very first thing I've got to do before I can go any further is to realign the tube. So basically I've got to go back and set the tube so that it is on true center so that the beam hits the middle of the target. Because if the beam is 10 millimeters diameter or 11 millimeters diameter, and I've only got 12 and a half millimeters to play with, I've got to be very accurate in my centering of the beam into the first mirror otherwise I've thrown the power away before we even start okay now we're going to check this tube for centralness with a pulse a tenth of a second at 25 percent and apart from the well something has happened at the top here the flaming or something at the top there 
the, the main dot appears to be fairly central. Not perfect, but fairly central, slightly over to the left. This time we're going to do a mode burn test, i.e. we're going to leave the beam on full power for four seconds. Okay, well we've got our puff of air coming out of here now, so that this doesn't catch fire. I should just make sure that everything is lined up correctly. I might just put a little piece of tape on there just to be sure to be sure. Make sure that it's located in both planes correctly. Right, so I've got the pulse set for 4,000 milliseconds now, which is four seconds. It's not perfect, but it's not far off centre. We look at it straight on. So we can trust a burn on the cardboard because it does centre up exactly with the burn in the acrylic. Well I just thought I'd demonstrate to you in real time how quick it is for me to change the mirror in here. Unfortunately the mirror is hidden behind this block here so you can't actually get to it from the back unlike the other machine. You actually have to take this block off completely and that's why I've changed all my screws for these rather strange looking things. Um, there used to be a screw in there that was that long and you had to compress the spring to get the, to get the screw through to fix in the back there and it was just a bit of a nightmare. Well now I've put long screws in there I've got this tool which enables me to take the tension off the springs completely I've got wing nuts on there then I've got nuts locked onto the end of a piece of studding there and they're acorn nuts And once I've taken the pressure off the spring, all I've got to do is turn my tool round and I've got a little spanner there that enables me to take these out. You don't actually have to take them all the way out. I can just unscrew them and leave them hanging there. Okay, so that's my block off now. And now what I've got to do is to remove the nut on the back there. And I've made this little tool here for doing just that. We'll take that copper mirror out and we'll put another polished copper mirror in which I've spent quite a bit of time trying to polish up nice and flat and shiny. Tighten the screws up first because there's no tension on them because the spring is not there. So I just wind them into the bottom of the slot that keeps them locked in there, and then all we go is just put the spring pressure on. And there we go, mirror changed. What's that, about three or four minutes? So we're now carrying out some further tests on this mirror. So after this initial test where we were getting 7% loss because of clipping the mirror, I've then set the beam back to central. And now we've carried out a whole raft of tests. First of all, let's take a look at the Molly mirror. I've done that a couple of times. And the first time I got an efficiency of 
I got a loss, let's call it that. We've got a loss of nearly 5%. Now, I then took the mirror and I cleaned it with Brasso and I checked it again. And in fact, I made it worse. I pushed it out to 5.7% loss. So cleaning it with Brasso doesn't seem like a good idea. So here are the results we've got for the gold mirrors. And a couple of tests confirm that we are getting approximately 5%, 4.7 and 4.9% loss on these gold mirrors. Gold is supposed to almost be as good a reflector of infrared as copper. So I would have expected these values to be in the region of about 2 maybe 3% maximum. This is a major disappointment. You saw the rather scratched and misshapen mirror that I had to start with, which was in fact this mirror. Now, I have done some work on trying to polish that up. And so we've got two sets of results here. One was, as you saw it, scratched, distorted, and we were getting 3.9% loss. Not good, but not terrible. Better than anything else we've seen. And then I went and polished this mirror up. That's this mirror at the top here. I repolished it. It's still not flat, but it's shinier. And I've removed a lot of the heavy scratches from it. And we moved that from 3.9% loss to 2.9% loss. And then what I did, I took another copper mirror that I had in my set and I completely reworked it and tried to make it as flat as possible. Not only shiny, but flat as well. Now, if you look carefully, as you'll see, it's curved at the edges. If I shine that, you can see that straight line going across the middle there. Well, it's changing its shape right in the middle there. So it's still not a flat mirror, but it's a shiny reflective mirror. And that, again, proved to be pretty beneficial because we got down to 2.6% loss. So we're gradually creeping down. Then, as you've seen, I've repolished the gold off this lovely gold-plated mirror and now if we can find that same white line again it's still slightly curved towards the edges because of the way in which I have to polish but it's basically quite a nice reasonably flat mirror now with the gold removed and that in turn produced 2.6% loss. So I think without any shadow of a doubt we can say that copper is more efficient than gold and gold is more efficient than the molybdenum. But at this moment in time I've only done tests for mirror one. I've got to extend this through to mirror two and three and then down to the lens. Well, I just don't have time at this moment. It's coming up to the new year and I've got a holiday that I'm going to be taking. So I'm going to break this off and call this end of part one because it's run on a lot longer than I expected it to because of all these problems. Um, and uh, we shall carry on and I shall see you in part two and we'll complete the project in part two. So thanks very much for your patience.